Okay, Shelley, um, it's interesting because when I did this the first time back in, I'm too loud, 2013, um, we only got up to lesson 38. And <laughs> so here we, and that was in one session. <clears throat> so here we got four sessions, we're up to 35, 36. All right, let's go to 36. I think we did this, didn't we? Yeah, we did, 36. <coughs> okay, let's see, what, well, we'll take another break at 3.30 or quarter four or something like that. So miracles are examples of right thinking, aligning your perception with truth as God created. Remember earlier we talked about the, there's what the Course calls right-mindedness. Which it also and it also distinguishes between wrong mindedness. Wrong mindedness would be obviously think in alignment with the ego. Right mindedness is where we start to think in alignment with the Holy Spirit. And then right mindedness is necessary before you can go to what the Course calls one mindedness. So one mindedness would then enable us to go to to level one, where you recognize that there is only one mind. Again, the ego is uh, in revolt against this um, because it looks like it's destruction, but it's not the point that our poor little human minds can't wrap themselves around, I think, is the fact that <laughs> one-mindedness doesn't mean that you lose your mind. Uh, one of the ways that I like to, to talk about that would be to say, does a butterfly remember the caterpillar? <clears throat> Got it? In other words, it's still the same thing, but it's totally different. Right? Pardon? No, it's not, I can't. You, there would be no need. Why would you want to? Right? Okay, so miracles are examples of right thinking, aligning your perception with truth as God created it. Again, and I talked about this all over, the right mind in this. All right, so let's go on. Oh, got to have a mic. He does. Ready? Oh, who's, okay. Okay, so um, just to be clear on this, so when we're not of the same mind, then is that our self-will at work. Yes. Okay. That was simple. Hmm, nothing like a yes or a no answer uh, question. <laughs> and we, we like to do that. I mean, we like to have that kind of that self assertion kind of thing, but that always. Oh, uh, I'm not going to go into it. So um, let's go on to the next one. Whoops. It's this one I need to do. So we don't go around, uh, oh, oh boy. I'll figure out how this works one of these days. Uh, here we go. Do not be afraid of the ego. It depends on your mind as you made it by believing in it. So you can dispel it by, by withdrawing belief from it. It's that simple. I mean, it's that simple as just withdrawing belief from its having any kind of reality at all. Do not project the responsibility for your belief in it onto anyone else or you, pre or you will preserve the belief. When you're willing to accept sole responsibility for the ego's existence, you will have laid all anger and all attack aside. Because they come <clears throat> from an attempt to project responsibility for your own errors. You know, if there's nothing else, I mean, this is the practical application of these principles now, right? Except sole responsibility for the ego's existence. You're all familiar with chapter 20, 
2, Section 2, Responsibility for Sight. I just repeated, <clears throat> I'm responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience. <clears throat> I decide upon the goal I would achieve and everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and I receive as I have asked. So that's accepting of the total responsibility. Yeah, but again, reading, just saying that, I just wanted to reiterate, when you say those captions like, I am responsible for what I see, they must be identifying with the mind and not the body. Because the body is not responsible for what it sees. No, of course The mind not. is responsible for what it interprets. Right. You know, that's why, you know, when we see that when you're willing to accept sole responsibility for your personal thought system of being separate from God, you will have laid aside all anger and attack. So the ego is not something. The Holy Spirit is not something. They're both thought systems. Mm -hmm. They're both thought systems in the mind. The, the Holy Spirit is the thought system in our mind that speaks for truth. The ego is just a, a meaningless symbol, which we call a word, that is the thought system of our belief in separation. All right. Very good. Okay. So, so it's the belief in separation that's, that's the basic problem. Stavro. So, Stavro. Yeah, you um, are. In short, um, accepting sole responsibility for the ego is to identify it as a cause. Which means that you, know, you now have a choice. Right, yes. So that's, that's, that is the cause. And, right. And we're not... Resp and uh, yes, and so, so the cause is not outside ourselves that we are the acting as an effect to, but we are the cause. All right, so now you can choose to see things a different way. That is the miracle. But the miracle is the ability to, to make another choice, to choose in alignment with the mind of God, rather within the alignment with the mind of this thing that we call an ego, which you think that you can't, you, you can't control. It's like... <clears throat> Let's say somebody that's very overweight and you're trying to lose weight uh, and you think that you can't control that. Right? But the mind is very much in, in charge of this whole thing. It's really a very simple decision. That doesn't always appear to be. And we blame the body. <laughs> the ego blames the body. The body made me do it. Well, the body doesn't make you do anything. Who's, who's running this body? But having accepted your, the errors as yours, do not keep them. You know, don't, get, don't start wallowing around in your insanity. Give them over quickly to the Holy Spirit to be undone. That's essentially what the miracle is. Again, it's the undoing of the error so that all their effects will vanish from your mind and from the sonship as a whole. So the miracle dissolves error because the Holy Spirit identifies error as it's false or unreal. It's just like you're, you're shining a light on something, and let's say that's not, that's not real, and shining the light on it enables it to go away. The, um, what needs healing is always the darkness we see in the world. Notice that we see in the world. Darkness, sin, is not outside the mind. By seeing it outside, I make it real. By seeing them, by my seeing then curses the world rather than blesses it. Right. The world needs not our blessing, needs our blessing, not our condemnation. God does not forgive because he is never condemned. So you've heard me say in the past, without reiterating it, that um, when I worked in prison for eight years, it was really a good exercise uh, not knowing the students' crimes because I got to see them as people, as human beings, without labeling something that had happened in there, with this, which was really just a, a very bad choice <laughs> that was made. That was often made out of, out of ignorance. I used to have a teacher, Dr. Thomas Hora. Anybody know Dr. Thomas Hora? Well, he was a, a transpersonal therapist who was teaching him prior to the course and about the same time as the course came out. 
And he used to say, ignorance is not a person. <laughs> yeah, I got, ignorance is not a person. So the miracle acknowledges everyone as your brother and mine. It's a way of perceiving the universal mark of God. The primary error of the miracle corrects is the idea of separation. We've said that. God has no favorite children. We're all equal. We're all exactly the same in God's eyes, which means we're one with Jesus. That may seem like arrogance, but it's not. The miracle is therefore a sign of love among equals. Equals should not be in awe of one another because equality, because all implies inequality. It's therefore an inappropriate action to me. Me is Jesus. Jesus is the one who's, who's talking here, right? Okay. Um, so before we go to um, 41, a quote from A Course in Miracles. If I intervene between your thoughts and their results, I would be tampering with a basic law of cause and effect the most fundamental law there is. I know that's, that's why I wanted to put this. This is the most fundamental law there is in the universe, is the law of cause and effect. And it works both positively and negatively. By positively and negatively, I simply mean the very best example is the more you love something, the more you experience love coming back your way. Uh, the more you condemn something, the more miserable you are, <laughs> right? But this is a basic law of the whole universe, right? That's back to your order of uh, things in the universe as well, right? There's an order to the, the divine order. The ego is completely out of order, which is also why it doesn't exist, because there can't be anything out of order, right? Which is back to what you were asking about earlier. I would hardly help you if I depreciated the power of your own thinking. This is one of the most, again, important things in the Course, is to realize how incredibly powerful your mind really is. And how it, such a simple thing as a choice makes all the difference in the world. Right? Like, for example, whether you lose weight or not. <laughs> such a simple thing. You know, just a, who bends the elbow? <laughs> who <laughs> does that? <laughs> Whatever that is that's being done, right? Stop it all. John, I just want to offer that I've narrowed my living down to two actions every day, picking things up and putting things down. Uh -huh. That's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all hear what he said? Do you understand what he said? Explain it again. Oh, um, what I do every day. I mean, from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, it occurred to me, all I do is pick things up and put things down. Uh, there's a choice. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a choice that's being, being made between... Uh, yeah. the, the, that's all, the, I, that's all I do, fundamental. <laughs> Pretty simple stuff, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, oh, come on. Okay, 41. Wholeness is the perceptual content of miracles. They thus correct or atone for a faulty perception or lack. I don't know whether this one needs much. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? That, that um, the, the, they correct a lack, a sense of lack, that there's something missing in you. Uh, I think just to, for the sake of time, I'm going to go on. So um, the conventional idea of the atonement, basic to Christianity, is a step expressed in the idea of penance, for which we get the word penitentiary, uh, originally a place of punishment for offenses against the church. Right? Um, in the Catholic Church, for example, one would have to pay pay for their sins. Do you all know about the experience in an eastern state Pencil, uh, in Pennsylvania, the Quakers, uh, back in the 1820s, it was really, really early on, 
there was a prison. See, the Quakers meditate a lot, right? And that's basic to their understanding. If they get quiet, they will find God. Works great for monks, works great for, for Quakers. But they thought that if, they, if they've got prisoners, if they got people who had committed crimes, and they simply put them in solitary, and they left them in solitary long enough, they would find God. It backfired big time. <laughs> because rather than finding God, they all went crazy. They all went insane. Because keep in mind, they're already going in there feeling guilty, right? They didn't have any training in <coughs> ways to retrain the mind themselves. And it just turned into a, a terrible, terrible mess. There's, you can go down there and tour that place now. It's, it's a place of torture. It, they, wouldn't, they were not allowed to have windows. There were skylights, but no windows. It's very uh, beautiful, though. I wish photographs. Oh, that's right. You did take photographs oh, there. It's amazing. But the thing that's disturbing, and they, they have these little plaques that say this is a, actually up during the time for the prisoners. Hey, hold this up. Hold this up. Would you? There were little microphones. Microphones. Would oh, you? Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. There were little slits. The only light coming into the rooms were on top of a cove in the prison cell with these little slits. And they, they hired somebody back in the middle of the existence of penitent the penitentiary to come in and put stained glass windows in, the, um, slits. in these little slits. Mm. But the stained glass were pictures of little children with broken necks. Oh my God! And it, it's really, it's really sad. And over the entrance, there's this stained glass, demonic, like uh, <coughs> gathering of people where people are strangling each other, hanging people with nooses. It's really disturbing. I'm like, is this new? And they said, no, this has been here since like 20 years before it closed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so that's why they closed it down because they noticed it was a very cruel place. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. They were not allowed to talk to each other. They were not allowed to see each other. In fact, if they came out of the prison cell, they had bags put over their heads so they wouldn't be able to see any other prisoners. Right. Anyhow. John? The idea, the idea was that they were going to correct the mines, and it went just the opposite. I grew up in that neighborhood. Oh, did you? That's where I grew up. So, um, you know, and when I was growing up, there was prisoners still there. Um, I just want to give the Quakers a break, oh. all right? Okay, just so it was a benevolent kind of a thing. They it, it, pensive is a is a word that they came up with or used was if it, you put somebody alone to make them think about what right. they've done, right? They work things out. Okay, I don't know when the cruelty came in, but the original project was like most utopias. They don't everybody doesn't fix themselves by themselves. But I think you guys are conflating that it became a federal penitentiary, you know, and it was you know, with a rich history, Al Capone, um, Willie Sutton, all kinds of like history there. And it's it, it, historically, it's a medieval castle that was built in 1822, first penitentiary ever, was never around. Um, the intention was good. I just want to give the Quakers off the hook. When it became a federal penitentiary, you know, it just became another penitentiary, and some maybe the Quaker rules um, right. didn't apply, and a lot of nasty things happened. Um, but uh, it's still there. Yeah, they can't. It's they were going to build a stadium there, and they calculated it would be too much too much money to knock it down. The walls are twelve foot wide at the base. Right. It's like a you know, it's a structure that nobody would make again. Right. Uh, in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, across from like the art museum area. Well, I understand that the intention was good on the part of, of the, the Quakers. It's just that it got... Yeah, the, I, I think a lot of the evil stuff came when he, it just became a regular penitentiary. Right. And they lost control of it. Right, okay. Let's not... Uh, we'll pass on this. Uh, I just want to say it's like religion. Religion. All religions start out with love. Right. Yeah. The it's idea is the fact that you think that you could correct someone through, the, through this kind of a process, right? 
Yeah. And it's not, the, the, the course, let's be clear. I'm going to send my phone around. Don't swipe or change any pictures, but I'm going to share one image. So pass this around as John's speaking. That's Eastern State. That's one of the cells yeah. that he took a picture of, that, what I was talking about. Um, all right, let's go on. I lost my train of thought. 42. We're making progress. Um, so a major contribution of miracles is their strength in releasing you from your false sense of isolation, deprivation, and lack. So now we're going in the opposite direction. By that, it simply means that <clears throat> once you give, once you're not trying to fix other people, you're not trying to correct other people, and, but, but just loving them, then you automatically begin to join with them. It's doing the releasing you from the false sense of isolation, deprivation, and lack. You can't, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about falling in love is you feel as though that you have <coughs> merged your mind with this other mind. And of course, we all know that can be problematic, <laughs> very problematic. But we can get back there again, right? Um, I watched a TED talk, by the way, on uh, what make people uh, happy. And I'd read also a previous, previous account on this, and the conclusion of both the TED Talk and the other study, which was done uh, 20 years or so ago, was that the happiest people on earth are those who have, enjoy close relationships. Right? And miracles have to help us to be free of our own stuff, which enables us to be more loving with others. That's the whole idea. Your stuff doesn't matter. It's just, it's just giving the love that matters. And so the, oh. uh, when you feel the, lone, the holiness of your relationship is threatened by anything, stop instantly. This is Course in Miracles, direct quote now. And offer the Holy Spirit your willingness in spite of fear to let him exchange the instant for the Holy One that you would rather have. But this goes, when you feel the... <clears throat> The Holy Spirit relationship is threatened by anything. Stop instantly. That's the point I wanted to emphasize. At that very moment, stop. Just, you know, we, we often see ourselves going insane. I talked about this earlier, actually. Just become really, the, the sooner you can catch it, the better. And then reverse it. And really, literally go the other way. And then the Course says, whoever is saner at the time the threat is per perceived should remember how deep is his indebtedness to the other and how much gratitude is to him and be glad that he can pay his debt by bringing happiness to both. It's an interesting line, whoever is saner at the time. <laughs> right? So in a relationship, if you see something that's kind of going a little crazy, and you realize that you're the one who's saner at the time. Uh, again, stop. You know, just stop right then and there. Don't feed it. Don't give any energy to it. And that will immediately begin to deflate it. And then once you can begin to deflate it, you can start to, to go in a different direction. Right? This is, a, this is a course in mind training, right? I was thinking, Mark, about the work you're doing now in terms of, can you apply some of these principles? Yeah. Maybe later you can tell us something about what you're, you're doing. That would be helpful. Mark, we're on, he's a, we're on positive psychology. Okay. Um, Miracles arise from a miraculous state of mind or a state of miracle readiness. This is one of the reasons we have the lessons in the workbook is we're, we are training the mind. We're trying to slowly, at this very slowly process of beginning to see things in literally a wholly different way. And then I quote from the Course, I've already said that miracles are expressions of miracle-mindedness. And miracle-mindedness means right-mindedness. 
the right-minded uh, neither exalt nor depreciate the mind of the miracle worker or the miracle receiver. However, as a correction, the miracle need not await the right-mindedness of the receiver. So you just go ahead and demonstrate it yourself. So living the Course means uh, coming to right-mindedness. We need to be in our right minds in order to overcome guilt and separation. Right-mindedness is the willingness to turn things over without thinking that you know. It's not one-mindedness. I said this earlier. However, you're on the doorstep of one-mindedness once you get to right-mindedness. You're very close. And then we already talked about this, but we re elect, a center line, we elect wrong-mindedness or right-mindedness. The only limit placed upon the mind is that it cannot serve two masters. That, and the Course emphasizes that a lot. You can't, and that's one of our problems, is that we go both ways. We think, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just have a little bit for me for right now. <laughs> John, you know, there's an, I'll, there's have, an, I'll do it my way. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that says, if you chase two rabbits, you will catch neither one. <laughs> Very good. Right. All right. Yeah, that is good. Okay. Um. All right. Let's do 44. The miracle is an expression of an inner awareness of Christ and the acceptance of his atonement. This is not a course in philosophical speculation, nor is it concerned with precise terminology. It's concerned only with the atonement or the correction of perception. That's all this is about. It's just about the correction of perception. So that we're seeing, and as, as Brad was saying a moment ago, it's not about what we're seeing with the eyes. It's what we're seeing with the mind's eye. How does the mind's eye see interpret. Or, or interpret what's going on? I just want to say something real quick. Go ahead. Um, it, it's like uh, once you have right mindedness, then you got to believe it. Because, <laughs> you know, there's so much, you know, right. stuff, ego is just waiting to pounce at right. any little. Eckhart Tolle says thoughts are like hooks, they drag you in, mm. and then he goes, ha, 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 you know, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you gotta, you gotta reinforce the right mind and pass the, it on. And the mic back. So in my reading lately, um, it came about belief, that belief, uh, that it, instead of belief, to know, right? Because belief leaves room for unbelief or disbelief. That's right. So, but to know, mm -hmm. then you know it. And it's not a question of belief. The th thing about belief is it's weak. It's very weak. I believe so. Doesn't mean I'm, I know so, right? All right. Um, neither are any of the accoutrements of the ego real. Personality, body, place, status, space, time, all these things are hindrances or limit, or they can be hindrances or limitations. They'll so block to the awareness of love's presence. If I'm caught up in being a <laughs> lieutenant or a captain or a I once went to speak at a church somewhere, and the guy that was in charge, I said in his home, I won't say anything about who or where this was, uh, had been a formal uh, Navy officer. And the whole house was Navy <laughs> officer. And there was a strong identification. He was in charge. He was the captain of that church. It was for sure. Uh, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying, the, 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 the thing had all kind of got caught up uh, which didn't help the minister out very much. Um, so the means of the atonement is forgiveness. The structure of individual consciousness is essentially irrelevant because it's a concept representing the original error or the original sin. 
To study air itself does not lead to correction. <laughs> or that's right. That's so important. This was something Ken emphasized a lot. Actually, the Course in Miracles says in the psychotherapy pamphlet, it says that the ego likes for you to study it. Because that proves that it's real. I mean, why would you study something that wasn't real? You're going to study it because it is. <laughs> it's a real thing. Yeah. All right. I, it's something I'd like to just bring about Ken, which is fascinating. He was a very pragmatic yes. practitioner of the Course. He didn't deal much with mysticism or things he wouldn't even comment on. You know what I mean? Which was, you know, because you have people now that are waking up, they've studied the course, and they're getting mystical experiences and things. And I was just wondering what you're, because you've had your mystical experiences, and, you know, Ken didn't really go there. He would just use, like, the course as a catalyst at, for our own self-discovery, and a kind of, like, practitioner of the text of the course, but wouldn't really go... I mean, he was had well, great wisdom and right. things like that about it, but would never really go into that. Now we have this burgeoning kind of mysticism movement popping all over the place, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, the bi autobiography of Christ, things are being channeled, all the stuff is coming through where, you know, I, I just like it gets sloshing around and then you're wondering how far are you with personal journey recourse? Because I'm not Mr. Mysticism either. I mean, I've insight into things, and I'm practicing all the time, but I'm not like being well, shook Ken, out into mystical experiences. Ken didn't talk about that a lot, but that doesn't mean that. I mean, certainly Ken had a very strong mystical background. Uh, but at the time that he met Helen and Bill, he was going to go off to become a monk. Uh, you don't want to go off and become a monk unless you're planning on spending a lot of time in, in meditation. Uh, he was very well read, in, actually, in terms of the mystics. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on St. Teresa of Avila uh, and her mental state of mind and what that was all about. So he knew that, but you're right about the, the emphasis upon the practical application, because I think he knew where it was, but the, still that stimulus was there. And I no, I, I, I believe probably he had his own things, but he didn't share that. I mean, he didn't go there. He did people. not talk a lot about his own experience. And I heard in one of his interviews right before he passed, he said, he, they, he was very point black. There was like young people were interviewing him. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I thought that they didn't give him his total reverence, but they were precocious in their questioning. Right. And, and, he, and they kind of hit on Mrs. Summers and something, and he said, why don't you talk? He said, well, it's not my thing. I don't huh. do that. Like, he was very point blank talking to Yeah, that. okay, well, that's yeah. true. He didn't talk about that a lot. By the way, you might want to uh, read, I, I opened this to a poem by somebody named Lynn Artino, but actually, uh, this is Lynn. Uh, read this article in here. This is called The Interconnected Love or Our Only Reality. This is a... A Course in Miracles, I love it, when, because I, I do mix it, obviously. Uh, a Course in Miracles student up in Canada who was studying the Course in Miracles and had a pretty profound mystical experience uh, after studying the Course, just literally sitting on her bed, <laughs> which is the second time that I've had. There was another one that I had in one of my previous books, which was a woman who was a cook on a Mississippi River boat, uh, on a barge that went up and down the Mississippi River. She took care of the guys that ran the barge. And one night after dinner, after fixing, cleaning of the pots in the pan, she goes back, she sits on her bunk, and she has this most profound mystical experience. I forgot which book it's in, but uh, it's wonderful just because it confirms, you know, what we're talking about here. Eddie? So I'm confused which is a state I'm in lots of times. Uh, so this starts off by saying the, the means of the atonement. It uses the word atonement. Earlier on today, uh, I got the impression that it said we don't have to do any atonement because things are just okay. okay. Right. So it's really a matter of understanding the word atonement. And of course, in miracles means something very different by the word atonement uh, than, say, you would be true in traditional Christianity, okay? 
in traditional Christianity, the atonement does mean that penance kind of thing, that we have to pay a price for our sins. It is not what it means in the Course at all. Uh, actually, if you substitute the word undoing for atonement when you're reading the Course, you'll, it'll read correctly. So the, the means of undoing is forgiveness. Right? And the atonement is really coming back to the mind of God again. right? And we, we come back to the mind of God again, essentially like by letting go of our insanity. Yeah, and so the insanity would be our attack thoughts, for example. The idea that we can entertain attack thoughts as though they were reality. All right, and I think we're going to get this done. Um, <laughs> one of the difficulties in traditional psychotherapy is the study of air. Uh, this can reinforce error rather than help us find freedom from it. In the same way, talking about our problems, we talked about this earlier, can exasperate the problems by placing emphasis on the reality of the problem. It's more miraculous to let a problem go. <laughs> Just let it go. Forgive us. It really doesn't matter. And sometimes, you know, when, when somebody, let's say, in just in conversation, gets harping on something, then you kind of want to, you kind of, why is that happening? Why are they stuck on a fault of some of a sister or a brother or somebody else? Why are they so identified with that? And you can't be identified with that unless it's in you. That's what the Course is saying. You know, you, you, we only see what's inside ourselves. And then that's what we wind up talking about. Can I add something? Um, but the only way to let error go is to be able to recognize it first. You know, that's why right. forgiveness is the means for having error undone because forgiveness steps back, it does not judge, and doing those two processes, we become aware of the working of the ego mind. And it's only through the awareness of the ego mind, which comes about through forgiveness, which is stepping back and not judging, that we are able to let it go. We right. just can't let something go unless we're aware of what it needs to be let go of. Right, right. Yeah. Well, we were talking about that earlier when I talked about, you know, stop. You know, stop when you see that it's happening. Okay. All right, so let's just go. Christ consciousness is a sustained state of consciousness which is not individual. Our determination to think outside of the mind of God gets us into the separated mind state. So Christ consciousness, which we'll talk about, can only be shared and cannot be limited to form. And I, earlier today I quoted this last line from Lesson 52. That there is a mind which we participate in and we're already there, but we block it. I like the word, uh, we obscure it by our own stuff. Our pitiful meaning was private thoughts. Okay. So a miracle is never lost. It may touch people who've not even met and produce undreamed of changes in situations which you're not even aware. It has a kind of ripple effect. The ripple effect, I mean, just because I can, if I heal a relationship with you and that feels better, that may maybe you, you feel better, which makes it easier for you to heal a relationship with somebody else. And it just keeps kind of running down the system like that so that everybody gets to be happier in the long run. I just yeah. want to say what works for me. Uh, I, when I, I try to recognize an ego, like ego alert, ego alert. <laughs> You're on. Huh? Your own ego alert. Yeah. Ego. Oh, yeah, my own yeah. ego alert. Yeah, right. Well, that's what happens when you study this stuff. Enough. Okay, we're going to get through this. A miracle is never lost. Oh, I did that. Let's go to 46. All right. So the Holy Spirit is the highest communication medium. Miracles do not involve this type of communication because they are temporary communication devices. 
Uh, earlier, not today, but you've heard me talk about the main learning devices. The body's a learning device. Time is a learning device. The holy instant is a learning device. And a miracle is a learning device. The reason why a miracle is a learning device, it shows you that this can be accomplished. It shows you that it can be done. All right? So, um, I, I, I've been reading A Course of Love uh, lately just because I feel like I want to read that. And according to The Course of Love, the time comes when learning ends and being begins. You know, there, there has to be a time when the learning is, we're learning. We're st this is a course in miracles. We're studying. We call this a class. But you want to get to the point where you're just being. And, and of course, it be, being is a state in which the mind is in communication with everything that is. It's a very natural state. You may remember that we said earlier, the miracles are natural. When they don't occur, something has gone wrong. So this is just being natural. How much, what's nicer than just being natural, right? Uh, we need no longer figure out the truth. We already know what it is now, so we just need to live the truth, which feels a lot better. <laughs> right? Um, when we finished our work in this world, when we have forgiven everyone we need to forgive, when our minds are no longer split, and we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit clearly, when we have recognized the truth of our being, we know our oneness. There's no need to hold on to any illusion. Then we can go home. Going home does not mean the death of the body. Yet we live in home in our heart and in the mind. The body has not anything to do with it. And 47, the miracle is a learning device that lessens the need for time. It establishes an out-of-time pattern of time, interval, not under the usual laws of time. In this sense, it's timeless. So a miracle could happen uh, instantly. For example, it doesn't need time. All right? Because it's a change of mind. A change of mind can happen instantaneously. Actually, even in a physical sense, it could happen instantly as well. So we talked about the four uh, learning devices, the body, time, the holy instant, and the miracle. Uh, the purpose of the learning device is to facilitate learning. We use time to learn. There is no need for time. <laughs> we use the body to learn of the non-reality of the body. Likewise, a holy instant and a miracle teaches us the non-reality of the outside world. Uh, there is no, there is more to life than what the eyes can see. Um, let's, let's skip a second break and let's just go through to four and get, we'll close, okay? How does that sound? Uh, so Helen once uh, protested to Jesus. She says, why is my life so difficult? And I thought this was an interesting response. Uh, externally speaking, Helen's life was not difficult. Uh, she had a good job. Uh, her bills were being paid. <laughs> uh, internally, however, she was going through a, a great deal, especially in her relationships. Uh, it was amazing. Helen understood this, but she could still be very judgmental. Uh, alarmingly so sometimes. It was difficult to understand. Uh, Jesus gave Helen the metaphor of a mountain, saying, you are walking through the mountain. It'd be much easier in terms of the effort required to walk up and down the mountain, but it would take much longer. <laughs> walking through the mountain is more difficult, but it saves a lot of time. So sometimes we go through difficult lessons in order to learn more quickly. There's a sort of pretty good analogy, and we probably have all had that, that happen, you know, where you... <clears throat> You're going through some really difficult thing, and you think, why in the world am I going through this really difficult thing? But actually, there's nothing that you're going through that's not a learning. And so sometimes you're learning much more rapidly than, <laughs> than at another time. You've got to have a mic. Okay, I got yeah. the mic. You got okay, the mic. I just want to add to the experience. I say I don't have mystical experience, but I think we have mystical experiences all the time, but we don't concur. Now, 
I recently, um, I'm a teacher, had to get a second license. I told you about this experience, right. right? So I had to take an undergraduate class, but as far as my recollection was, I just had to take the class. It was a non-degree. But um, on Mondays, I have a long day. I have a PD, an hour and 40 minutes that I had to go to this class where this guy talked at me. He was Nigerian Catholic, and I was thrown back into Catholic school. He talked at us in old-fashioned pedagogy with concrete answers. He wanted things exactly the way, back in definitions, the way he was talking. And he was talking about pedagogy, which I have a master's in, which a master's is nothing, because after I got the master's, I felt stupider. <laughs> so anyway, I had to listen to him for two and a half hours, and we didn't get along. I would just pop, like, here, I have to pop and say something. And then he would just shut it down. It was threatening to him. It was torture. It was 16 two and a half hour classes. And he would like mark up my papers, and like I was getting his back. I was like, what am, what am I doing here? It was just torturous all together. But I kept doing the Holy Spirit, giving it to the Holy Spirit, and like um, you know, giving it all to Him. All the way through, I kept, gave it to the Holy Spirit. Gave it to the Holy Spirit. Um, when I went to the, I went to the retreat out in Utah. I came back. I missed a class, and then I missed giving him this midterm project, which I had already done. It wasn't much for me to do it, because I have all this stuff. But I had to do it his way, in his format. He didn't accept it. So I figured, OK, let's, like, he was really belligerent. He was like, shut me down. I said, like, he didn't accept it. I go all the way to the end of the class, right? I go all the way through. I do the final examination. It had to be handwritten. It was like, no questions, just everything. These, these big essays we had to write about pedagogy and his questions. I go through, I find out in July he flunked me, right? So I need this for my license. This is like job, and I'm like insecurity wrapped up, but I was giving it to the Holy Spirit. I went through a big forgiveness with him, almost teared up. I said, it's okay, it's not real. This guy is suffering just like everybody else is something. I got to forgive him, I got to forgive him, I got to forgive him. So he flunked me, so I had to write to him, and I was avoiding him because I didn't want to get into this contention because I'm so reactive. Like, you know, there was all this backed up stuff with me at Catholic school. I didn't want to just explode in front of them. So, and, I, and I'd be done because I needed this for my license. I just needed this little class to complete this license agreement. So I write them. I give forgiveness. I'm blessing it all the time, blessing it, right? I go through the whole thing. He, find, he, can't, he won't be back till August. I wait till August. I give him the stuff as soon as I can, wrap it up. Um, then the he, I, I, I go back to the registration. They, the, the grade has not changed. I contact him again. He says, I changed it. They're just doing it slow. I fight with the red registration to move the grade through the dean's office all the way over to make the transfer. And the day they put the B, gave me a B, he gave me a B. The day they transferred the grade in, because I took this other workshop prior to that, that was another requirement. In the mail, as soon as it was B, I saw the B, I opened up the mail, and there was my professional certificate. I didn't even need the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the professional. Finally, I get through <laughs> at the end. But it, I think I needed it, but I think this is the way miracles work. But it was just something I had to go through. I get the damn B, was, and it cost me money. It cost me aggravation. It cost me all this. And, Brought me back from all my other stuff. But you learned something by going through the mountain. Well, it was about trusting. The miracle right. was given. I really asked for forgiveness. I asked for forgive him, forgive me. I know I played in it. I know it was in, I should be fighting with the professor. Right. And there it was in ink, professional certificate. Oh, by the way, you got your B. But that Albany never got it. Just, so it was like inconsequential. <laughs> all right, I guess I don't know what that meant, but anyway. <laughs> All right, let's 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 wrap this up. Um, this is uh, Gerda. You have to watch out for what you ask for. You might get it. <laughs> um, and 48, we only got two more to go. Uh, <laughs> the miracle is the only device at your immediate disposal for con controlling time. Only revelation transcends it, having nothing to do with time at all. So a revelation is, can happen outside of time. And of course, this revelation is intensely personal and can be meaningfully cannot be meaningfully translated. That's why an attempt to describe it in words is impossible. Revolution, revelation 
induces only experience. So it's another dimension. Um, I think that explains itself, doesn't it? All right. Uh, let, let, revelation is literally unspeakable because of the experience of unspeakable love. We can't even talk about it. But, but you, you, it's a knowing. It's knowing. Knowing. Right? 49. <laughs> 49 is a repetition of one. <laughs> it really is. What's, what's one? Anybody remember one by this time? There are no more difficulties in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than the other. All expressions Give that student an A, will you? <laughs> so, the miracle rex makes no distinction among degrees of misperception. It's a device perception correction, effective quite apart from either the degree or the direction of the air. It thus under it it is this is its true indiscriminateness. So as I said, it's a rep repetition of one. Right? They're all the same. And finally, uh, the miracle compares what you have made with creation, accepting what is in accordance with it as true and rejecting what's out of accord is false. That's very simple. That's what the whole function of it. It's clearing out the faults. Creation, according to ACIM, is the extension of God's being or spirit, the cause that results in his son, the effect, which is the effect. It is his son's function in heaven to create. The Course talks a lot about creation. It never really says what creation is, but it does say it's our function in heaven. And I think what it comes down to is simply it's an extension of love. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to talk about what creation is. It, it, it's not talking about it in a practical sense, but it may be in a practical sense as well. Yeah. Uh, you gotta have the mic. All right. Um, just about the, about the creation um, huh. part. There's, um, there's, in the Course, it says that our creations are stored in a storehouse awaiting us. But what are they? What would those creations, I mean, I try to imagine. It I, says that they're stored? Yes, that we have creations are stored. Right, yeah, I know it does. Yeah. But what are they? <laughs> I mean. Right, I, I th that, that it, of course, what never. What is it that it, we're it, creating? I know, uh, well, I was trying to answer it uh -huh. as best I could, because it never says. But I, th I think we can understand that it is whatever comes out of love. Whatever comes out of love is a creation, right? What do you think it is? Well, what, 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 whatever loving means. It's the joining. Well, I think you know, you know, a storehouse is something that contains. So it's almost like they're things. It's, it sounds like it, but I don't think it's literal. It really it, it's, not. it's not that literal. Okay. It's, it, for one thing, it, it, you could understand it to be a relationship, right? Keep in mind, of course, is divine abstraction. God takes joy in sharing. So it comes in the sharing of the love, which we right. just keep, that, which that we keep good. doing. Right. That feels good. Yes. Okay. You know, Thank you. Because if you look at this first sentence, when it says, the miracle compares what you have made, what we have made, what we have made is form, is limited, and it's of time. What is created, our creations, are formless, are timeless, and are limitless. So our creations are the love that we express towards others that are timeless, formless, and limitless. So they have nothing to do with anything in this world. Right. Creation is not nothing thing. to do with this world. So the miracle compares and corrects what we have made, which is limited, timeless, and form, I mean limit, limit, form, and time, with what we create, limitless, timeless, and formless. Great. Yeah. Very good, Brad. Thank you. Okay, there's just one other thing I'd like to do today. I want to lead a little closing meditation. Can we do that? However, I need to get something out of here. <clears throat> so
So let's just transcend all this. Good. I want you to dim the lights a little bit, but not completely so I can see this. <clears throat> That's good. That's good. All right, this is uh, Lesson 45 from A Course in Miracles. So take a couple of deep breaths and just relax and be very present. This is where the Course is taking us. God is the mind in which I think. Today's idea holds the key to what your real thoughts are. They're nothing that you think you think. Just as nothing that you think you see is related to vision in any way. And what you think is real. Nothing that you think are your real thoughts resemble your real thoughts in any respect. Nothing that you think you see bears any resemblance to what vision will show you. God is the mind in which I think. You think with the mind of God. Therefore, you share your thoughts with him as he shares his with you. They are the same thoughts because they are thought by the same mind. To share is to make alike or to make one. Nor do the thoughts you think with the mind of God leave your mind, because thoughts do not leave their source. Therefore, your thoughts are in the mind of God as you are. They are in your mind as well where he is. As you are part of his mind, so are your thoughts part of his mind. Where then are your real thoughts? Today we will attempt to reach them. We will have to look for them in your mind because that is where they are. They must still be there because they cannot have left their source. What is thought by the mind of God is eternal, being part of creation. God is the mind in which I think. We are attempting to leave the unreal and seek for the real. We will deny the world in favor of truth. We will not let the thoughts of the world hold us back. We will not let the belief of the world tell us that what God would have us do is impossible. Instead, we will try to recognize that only what God would have us do is possible. God is the mind in which I think. Only what God would have us do is what we want to do. And we cannot fail in doing what he would have us do. There is every reason to feel confident that we will succeed. If the will of God, it is the will of God. Repeat this idea to yourself. God is the mind in which I think. Try to go past all the unreal thoughts that cover the truth in your mind and reach to the eternal. Under all the senseless thoughts and mad ideas with which you have cluttered up your mind are the thoughts that you think with God in the beginning. They are there in your mind now, completely unchanged. 
They will always be in your mind exactly as they always were. God is the mind in which I think. You may be unable as yet to recognize how high you are trying to go. This is no idle game, but an exercise in holiness and an attempt to reach the kingdom of heaven. Repeat the idea to yourself. God is the mind in which I think. Think. Appreciate your mind's wholeness. Stand aside briefly from all thoughts that are unworthy of him, whose host you are, and thank him for the thoughts he is thinking with you. God is the mind in which I think. So be it. Thank you. When you're ready, open your eyes and come back to the room. So thank you for being here. In October, we, um, David Fisherman will be with me, and I'm not sure what we're going to share together. But then in November, we will start looking at the psychotherapy pamphlet which is really, really full. Good stuff. Okay. And if anybody wants to go out with us afterwards to uh, we, we, we go eat together, why just come join us. Okay, I'll show you where. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat>